Good morning and welcome to the Green Ribbon Commission Climate Action Exchange, otherwise known as GRCX. My name is Adam Chapdelaine and I serve as the Deputy Director of the Boston Green Ribbon Commission. We're really excited about this morning's program. Uh, over 150 people registered and I can see you all signing on and logging on and we really wanna thank you for taking the time to log in to learn about today's important topic. For those of you who are joining for the first time, GRCX is an interactive virtual program series designed to support the GRC's mission of accelerating the implementation of the city's climate action plan. So before I dive into today's topic, allow me just to cover some brief logistical notes. First, we are recording this session. Next, after today's meeting, you're gonna get an email with a link to the recording, as well as a copy of the slides. And finally, for Q&A today, please use the chat function. If you input your questions at any time throughout the program into chat, as the moderator, I'll collect them. And then when we are done hearing from our panelists, we will work through the questions that you've submitted via the chat. The way we have it set up, technically you won't be able to see the questions, but we will get them and we'll be sure uh, that we, uh, as time allows, that we facilitate the panel answering these questions. So with that, let's dive right into today's topic, which is green infrastructure, addressing Boston's stormwater woes. I think as most of those attending well know, stormwater management is a critical challenge which faces Boston and frankly, the region as a whole. Stormwater or runoff allows untreated water into Boston waterways. It also causes overland flooding as existing systems lack the capacity to manage the volume of rain falling more frequently in higher intensity storms. Making the necessary investments to enhance capacity while also limiting the amount of pollutants that enter local waterways will be a costly endeavor and one that needs to be integrated with other critical efforts focused on improving the city's climate resiliency. The city and private property owners share the challenge as the systems that convey collect and discharge stormwater across public and private property lines. Today's GRCX will provide an overview of EPA Region 1's recently updated regulations for stormwater management, Boston's proposed integrated green infrastructure approach, and a discussion of threats, challenges, and opportunities in the watersheds in and around Boston related to stormwater management and the installation of green infrastructure. And we're very fortunate today to have a terrific panel that's gonna walk us through this discussion. First, we'll hear from Ken Morath, who's the director of the water division at EPA's New England Regional Office. Ken has led major environmental projects, including the Boston Harbor and Charles River cleanups, and has helped the EPA develop innovative approaches to complex challenges, including nutrient pollution and contaminated stormwater runoff. Ken previously served as manager of EPA New England's enforcement program. Then we'll hear from Kate England, who is the director of green infrastructure for the city of Boston. She has a background in engineering, landscape architecture, planning, and policy, and has worked in the public sector in and around Boston for most of her career. Kate was appointed by Mayor Wu in July of 2022 to facilitate the widespread implementation of green infrastructure and help pursue the resilience goals outlined in Boston's Green New Deal. Prior to joining the city, Kate worked for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR, where she served as the regional engineer for the Boston region. And then we'll hear from Patrick Heron, who serves as the Mystic River Watershed Association's executive director. He joined the association as the water quality monitoring director in 2009 and became executive director in 2016. Prior to joining the association, Patrick completed a doctorate in plant ecology at the University of Connecticut in 2007 and held postdoctoral positions at the Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory and the Rowland Institute at Harvard University. So we're very fortunate to have this panel today. I'm excited to hear from them. I'm excited for them to share with you. And I'm excited to have a very, hopefully engaging Q&A after we hear from, the, from our presenters. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Ken to walk through his presentation. Thank you, Ken. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. 
any day that starts with a stormwater discussion is a great day. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, so can we go to the next slide? All right, so this is a picture of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and I'll use the Charles River as an example, um, but we're working in um, doing a lot also in the Neponset and the Mystic and rivers across New England. Um, this is an algae bloom in the Charles River. It's not just an aesthetic problem that the river turns bright green in the summer. This is, it sometimes are toxic blue-green algae blooms, and that's a real problem. Um, so that's, that's the issue we're trying to solve. Next slide. And this is not just an issue in the Boston area. This is a problem all across New England. What you're seeing here is a picture of uh, stormwater runoff coming out of the Connecticut River and polluting a wide area of Long Island Sound. And this is happening all across New England and all across the country. And in fact, stormwater, when we, when we look at water bodies across our region, across New England, and the causes of water quality impairments, stormwater is the number one cause of those problems. So if we want to have clean water in New England, we have to fix stormwater. Next slide. Here's another picture of an algae bloom in the Charles River. And when we look at, at what we need to do to address water quality issues like this, um, what we've learned over time is that every water quality problem is local. It's a product of the specific characteristics of the water body and of the watershed that drains into it. So every solution needs to be local. It needs to be tailored to exactly what the conditions are that are causing the problem. In the Charles River, which I'm going to use as an example, um, the issue is too much phosphorus. Phosphorus is a nutrient. Algae blooms are driven by nutrients. In a lot of the country, when I meet with my colleagues from other EPA regions, agriculture is the driver. Um, but in New England, it's usually urban development. And that's why for us, stormwater is the real issue. Um, the nutrients come from all kinds of sources, from bird droppings, pet waste, leaf litter, other organic material, collects on the pavements, washes into storm drains when it rains, and then the stormwater pipes carry it to the river. Next slide. So stormwater is not the only source of phosphorus, but in the Charles, we've already invested hundreds of millions of dollars to address the other sources. And this chart shows you, it tries to give you a visual picture of that. It's looking at the tall bar on the left, that's how much phosphorus we had in the 1970s. And as you can see, a lot of it was coming from municipal sewage treatment plants, that green section in the middle. That has been largely eliminated. You see just a green sliver left as the municipal treatment plants have invested a lot of money in upgrades to remove phosphorus. So a big, a big chunk of the problem was solved through those investments. Sewer overflows, the light blue portion in the bar from the 1970s, have been largely eliminated, not completely, um, but to the, to the extent that they're not a real factor anymore in the phosphorus issue. So what's left is stormwater, that darker blue segment that's on the bottom of the pile in the 1970s, but now is almost the whole picture of what's left. Um, in that middle bar there, you see the current loads. Um, all of that blue is existing phosphorus load from stormwater and the, hash, the hashed area that represents about half of that load is what we need to remove to meet the water quality standards that we're trying to achieve. Um, so that's a, a visual picture that just kind of tells you the story of, we started with the phosphorus coming from a lot of sources. We've been very successful in getting it out of, of municipal sewage treatment plants and sewer overflows, but what's left is stormwater. Next slide. Um, so Massachusetts, working with EPA, developed a phosphorus budget for the Charles. This is, if you've heard of um, TMDLs, and I know many of you know TMDLs well, but for those who don't, it stands for Total Maximum Daily Load. It's basically the pollution budget. Um, it tells you how much we need to reduce phosphorus to meet water quality standards and get rid of these algae blooms. Um, so it gives this chart just gives you a scale of the 
it gives you an idea of the scale of the reductions that we need, which are around 60 to 65 percent um, reductions from developed properties. Next slide. Another way to look at that data is you can look at each municipality and based on its land use and the type of development it has, how much phosphorus does it need to reduce to meet the target? And those numbers range from typically the low 50s into the 60s um, in terms of percentage. So that's a big chunk. We need to get out more than half the phosphorus to address this problem. So now I'm gonna shift to, so, that, so that's the problem we're trying to solve in the Charles. We have similar problems in the deposit and in the mystic. Um, there are additional problems with bacteria and other pollutants, and that really varies river to river. Um, I'm just using this as an example to show you how we analyze a water quality problem. And now I'm gonna shift into what's the regulatory structure that we're gonna use to solve that problem. Next slide. Um, so this is the foundation. This is the Clean Water Act, um, which is a very powerful law um, passed in 19, 1972. We just had the 50th anniversary. And here's the key section of the Clean Water Act, which basically says you cannot discharge any pollutant into a water of the United States and unless you meet the requirements of the Clean Water Act. And I've highlighted a couple of the requirements here. Section 1312 says you need a permit to discharge. The permit's going to have all kinds of conditions that you need to meet. And Section 1342 gives you more details specifically about stormwater discharges and what kind of stormwater permits are needed. So this very short section of the Clean Water Act is the foundation that we build on in, in all of our regulatory efforts. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk about the structure that we build on that foundation. And the first level of that structure is, and really the key to everything, is the municipal stormwater permit, um, which is known as the MS4 permit, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, MS4. Um, but they're municipal stormwater permits. Um, we have issued um, a general permit that covers most municipalities in Massachusetts. It's a five-year permit that was last updated in 2018. So we're working very hard on the next one now. Um, Boston and Worcester, because of their size, they have individual permits and that's how our program's set up. Most municipalities are covered by the general permit, but if you're big enough, you get an individual permit that's more tailored to your specific conditions. Um, the M these MS4 permits, have basic requirements that apply to all communities, but they also have more tailored requirements to address specific water quality issues. So as an example, um, again, turning back to the Charles River, where we've set targets for reducing phosphorus, um, we have put those targets into the permit itself. So that those become enforceable legal requirements. And that's, that's the engine that's gonna drive the ultimate solution of this problem is that the numbers that we need to meet that as a result of scientific studies about how much phosphorus do we need to reduce to get rid of these algae blooms, those all get translated into the permits and then become enforceable legal requirements. Um, in the Mystic River, that's something we're going to be doing in this next round that we're working on now, the next update of the MS4 permits. Um, so the Mystic will also have legally enforceable requirements to get these reductions. Um, so how are municipalities gonna meet these targets? Some of them through housekeeping practices like street sweeping and picking up leaf litter, um, but much of it will need to be done by retrofitting existing properties, um, largely with green infrastructure to, to remove phosphorus. If you're gonna get a 50 or 60% reduction, you're going to have to build something. You're going to have to capture the stormwater and get it into the ground um, so that nature can do its work um, and, and not, have, not have it go out through pipes into the river. Um, so I want to make a couple of points here about the, about the structure. One is that just to underscore, all of these requirements are driven by water quality. 
and it goes back to the Clean Water Act, which is what we're building on. We have the authority to require that discharges meet water quality standards. We all know, anyone who's working with clean infrastructure knows that there are many co-benefits to clean infrastructure, including climate co-benefits, but EPA's authority is to protect water quality and the requirements are designed for that purpose. And I'm gonna come back to this point um, because I'm really interested in the integration of the water quality benefits of green infrastructure with other benefits, especially climate resilience. Um, so I'm gonna come back to this. Uh, the, but the second point I wanna make at this point is that this is a really big job for the municipalities. If you think about how you're gonna reduce phosphorus by more than half, and the municipalities are responsible not just for the stormwater on municipal lands, but for all the stormwater that goes through the municipal system. So that includes runoff from all the private properties that are connected into the city's stormwater system. So how does a municipality go about getting those reductions? Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. Next slide. And so now this is, a, if you think about a second story on the, in the regulatory structure, we have the Clean Water Act as the foundation and the municipal permits as the first level Here's a second level that we're building um, there. So I, I talked about the municipal permits. There are also other kinds of stormwater permits. We have permits for construction activities. We have permits for industrial stormwater, um, but the Clean Water Act also gives EPA authority to regulate other discharges that contribute to a water quality problem. And that's that authority is kind of circled on this chart. It's case by case authority to, to issue stormwater permits. It's called residual designation, which is not a catchy name, but it's our residual authority to bring in other sources of water quality problems. Once we exercise that authority, the, anyone who owns those discharges needs their own stormwater permits. And EPA and states can do this on their own, or people can petition us to do it. And in for the EPA has received petitions for the Mystic, Neponset, and Charles Rivers um, to, to require that private property owners in, the, in those three watersheds be required to get stormwater permits uh, because they contribute to water quality problems in all those rivers. Um, the, the petitioners have argued that the municipalities really need help to solve this problem. They, they need the private sector to come in and do their part. So EPA has studied these petitions, done some very extensive technical analysis on them. And in September, 2022, we did issue a designation um, that, cut, that requires commercial, industrial, and institutional properties in those three watersheds to get stormwater permits. And it applies to properties with one or more acres of impervious cover. So it's not every small property, it's we're targeting the larger ones, but we're still talking about thousands and thousands of properties. Um, so once those permits are issued, and that's what we're working on now, um, the stormwater controls in these watersheds will be driven by two sets of permits, the municipal permits and these private sector permits. Um, next slide. So just a couple of images of, of green infrastructure. I'm not gonna dwell on this because I think most people in the audience probably are very familiar with what green infrastructure is. Next slide. So in the permits, our approach has been to identify specific management practices that can reduce phosphorus and spell out what kind of credit you can get for each practice so that the permittees can decide what they're going to build and then add it up and make sure that the, the, the reductions match what they're required to achieve. Um, so that's our, that's our approach. As I said before, it's very driven by water quality because that's the source of our authority. Um, and it's going to drive, these permits will drive a lot of green infrastructure. Next slide. So here's where it gets really interesting. And I'm really hoping to learn something from the presentations that follow mine and from the discussion that follows about how this all comes together because I've been emphasizing our regulatory approach is driven by water quality because that's the source of our authority. 
But as all of you know, the magic of green infrastructure is in the co-benefits, the fact that it can solve multiple problems. Um, this is a picture of a school in Portland, Oregon. I did just a great tour of stormwater, of, of green infrastructure in Portland, Oregon, um, led by the DPW out there who love green infrastructure. And they built hundreds of projects across the city. And the point of this picture is that this was a school completely surrounded by asphalt, just a huge area of asphalt. And they decided to build this green infrastructure, sort of a rain garden, but it's highly engineered to capture all of the runoff from that asphalt. And it worked really well. The, the purpose of it was to, was to prevent sewer overflows, um, to remove sewer overflows that were going into a nearby stream. And it worked really well. For that purpose, but then they discovered that the classrooms that bordered on this new garden were able to turn off their air conditioners because they no longer had that heat island effect. And no one had planned the project to do that. It was just a really nice co-benefit. Um, and so, and they also, as Portland was implementing all these hundreds of projects, what they decided to do was they were all driven by the need to reduce sewer overflows. They were driven by a court order. Um, but the DPW decided to site them in areas where there were also neighborhood flooding problems so that they could both solve the water quality problems and address flooding resilience issues. So finding the ways to get those co-benefits just seems like a really good idea. Even if the regulatory structure is only driven by water quality, finding ways to address other problems if you're gonna make this massive investment just seems like a really good idea. Next slide. So I wanna just talk a little bit about analytical approaches. So this chart illustrates one way for a community to, to develop its phosphorus control plan. All of the dots on this graph are different combinations of, of green infrastructure projects that could achieve the water quality target. And that red curve that you get on, on the top is represents the most cost effective sets of projects that can achieve a particular water quality goal. Um, so this this is a way for communities to make sure that they pick the most cost effective way to meet a phosphorus goal. I look at this chart and think there needs to be at least one more dimension to it because shouldn't we also be looking at what are the flood reduction benefits of each of these combinations of green infrastructure projects? So I, I imagine a Z axis coming up, creating a more of a surface, a three dimensional surface where you would then pick the point where you're maximizing phosphorus control and flood reduction benefits in the most cost effective way. And maybe, maybe we need to think about even a fourth dimension or fifth dimension for other co-benefits. And it starts to get really complicated. Um, but this is what I'm really interested in hearing more about in the discussion is how can you take, if there's going to be this massive investment driven by water quality needs, how can we take maximum advantage of that investment to also serve these other purposes? And I know other people are working really hard on those other goals. And how do we put it all together so that we're working for a common purpose um, and not missing opportunities to get co-benefits across those efforts? Um, I, I'm really hoping to learn a lot more about that in the next hour and over the next few years. And next slide. I'm going to stop there and really look forward to the next presentation. Thank you so much, Ken. That was really a great presentation. I, uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank the attendees who have been submitting excellent questions. I'm collecting them in a separate Google document. And once we hear from all our panelists, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Please keep asking questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate England to hear from the city's perspective in regards to green infrastructure. Great. Thanks, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate England. I'm the Director of Green Infrastructure for the City of Boston. Uh, next slide. Uh, put together a brief agenda for what I'm going to go through uh, in my presentation. So uh, Ken obviously gave a wonderful introduction to what's the problem with stormwater. So I'm very, very briefly going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what the city is thinking about. 
Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what is green infrastructure. I know many of you on this call are already familiar with this, so that will also be relatively brief, but just to give everyone an idea of you know, what our definition uh, at the city looks like, uh, since we've already heard quite a bit from Ken um, and, and we'll hear more um, in our subsequent presentation. I won't spend too, too much time on that, but just kind of give everybody a nice orientation. Uh, then I'm going to talk about two uh, projects that are uh, City of Boston projects that the city is looking to uh, replicate in the future um, and, and obviously expand um, our implementation uh, in, in that direction. And then uh, I have a couple of examples of some private green infrastructure that I'm going to show just to, um, to kind of highlight the, the kind of unique position of private property owners uh, in the city and what they're able to accomplish in the green infrastructure world, um, you know, that maybe I'm not as capable um, as, you know, of accomplishing uh, from the public perspective. Um, and then last but not least, talk a little bit about the future of green infrastructure in Boston um, and, you know, what the city is doing to uh, expand implementation. Next slide, please. So what's the problem? Uh, Ken's explanation was spectacular. And so I won't spend too, too much time here, but um, you know, we generally, when we think about stormwater and problems with stormwater, um, I think one of the main problems that we have is we think of stormwater as a problem um, as opposed to as a resource. Um, and so one of the things that I wanna kind of get people thinking about now that you've heard from Ken about all of the pollutant loading problems and the fact that as, as rainwater and other precipitation kind of travels across our hard surfaces in cities and picks up you know, pollutants and phosphorus and um, you know litter and other things and carries it to our waterways that we kind of historically have seen stormwater as a waste and as a problem that needs to be um, quickly removed and piped to um, our waterways um, or treatment plants as quickly as possible. And I think that there's been a shift in perception of stormwater that is allowing individuals uh, to see stormwater as a resource, something that can be used and should be used um, you know, to help kind of fuel our cities, to help, um, you know, water our, our plants, um, you know, in our homes and, and to help uh, water plants in our right-of-ways. Um, and, you know, this kind of idea of, you know, it's just this polluted waste that needs to be removed, um, thankfully, has kind of started to, to diminish a little bit. Um, so to Ken's point, there are lots of, um, you know, pollutants and other things in uh, our urban waterways specifically because it's been carried there by our stormwater. Um, and what happens when uh, you know pollutants and litter and all of these other things end up in our waterways is that we have impaired waterways. Um, and so I mentioned the 303D impaired waters list. Um, the water bodies around the city of Boston um, are all on this 303D list of impaired water bodies. Um, so Boston Harbor, the Charles River, the Mystic, uh, Neponset and, and a bunch of the tributaries of these water bodies all uh, have been um, assessed and determined to not be meeting their um, their prescribed uses. And so as a result, you have several TMDLs, which Ken talked about in his presentation, that have been written that indicate how much pollution or how many or what percentage of pollutants need to be removed from our water bodies. Um, so next slide, please. The, that's the water quality problem. And then there's also the flooding component that is that is an issue that we have to think about. Um, and so the image that you're seeing on the screen is just one storm that was modeled. It's the 10 year, 24 hour storm event. Um, and all of the green areas that you're seeing are locations in the city where there's inundation or flooding um, predicted uh, in the very near future. And so in addition to that water quality issue, we also have this flooding and inundation issue that we also have to deal with. And this is a problem that, as you can see from the distribution um, you know, on this map, and it's a, a similar distribution in cities and towns in the region and across the country, um, this is going to affect us all. Um, so our water quality issues, again, affect everyone, and then these inundation issues will affect everyone. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about green infrastructure and its role in addressing some of these um, problems with stormwater. Next slide. So what is green infrastructure? Um, we know, I think, in the stormwater world that green infrastructure features are essentially, uh, you know, 
features that use soil and plants and other natural materials to remove pollutants from stormwater. Um, we talk a lot about rain gardens and bioswales. I think those are features that um, people are, are fairly familiar with at this point. Um, next slide, please. There are also a couple of other examples that you're probably familiar with. We have green roofs, um, a suite of porous paving options, uh, constructed wetlands, um, and something that you've probably seen in the city and maybe not even known that you were walking over it are these um, stormwater tree pits or infiltrating tree trenches. Um, so lots of different options for you know both public and private projects to implement. And these features all have, uh, next slide please, multiple benefits. Um, Ken, your presentation was a perfect cue up right down to the language that we use. Um, so green infrastructure obviously has a lot of really wonderful co-benefits. And at the city of Boston, we are thinking about green infrastructure beyond just the stormwater benefits. We see it as a way for us to meet a variety of goals. Um, and so as you can see on, on the screen right now, um, you know, green infrastructure features help to increase uh, green space and and grow healthy trees, increasing tree canopy in our city. Uh, you know, more trees and more vegetation means a reduction in the urban heat island effect, which uh, Ken's little uh, Ken's example of the, the little schoolyard uh, installation kind of demonstrated that really nicely. Um, you know, having vegetation in your, um, you know, that breaks up your paved and hard surfaces can result in reductions uh, in, in heating uh, and cooling costs, depending on the time of year. Um, and, you know, it can also be used to help increase pedestrian safety. And um, we often use it as part of our slow streets projects in the city. Um, you can also see an increase in, or I guess an improvement in some of our historic environmental justice issues. So, for example, it helps to improve air quality in our neighborhoods where we have, um, you know, diminished air quality. Uh, it also provides access to nature in neighborhoods that are largely paved and don't have a lot of access to green space. Um, and green infrastructure can also be uh, useful in food security efforts. So there's, um, you know, there's there's a lot of really wonderful installations in the city of Boston and across the country where green infrastructure has been used for urban agriculture um, and to fuel urban farming, um, which is a really wonderful um, kind of addition to our food, our food security network that we're creating here. And then obviously there's the environmental education component here. So green infrastructure features provide a wonderful opportunity to educate people about stormwater, about green infrastructure, um, and about all of these co-benefits that we just talked about. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk, I have two examples of some projects that we did in the city of Boston. Uh, they are both uh, collaborative projects, meaning that they were done with multiple departments working together. Um, this model is something that the city of Boston is looking to uh, replicate and continue moving forward. There's a lot of work being done at the city right now to uh, to encourage and increase, uh, you know, these kind of group collaborative projects. Um, and so the first example, uh, next slide please, is uh, Central Square in East Boston. Central Square was a collaborative project that was done about four, well, five years ago, actually now at this point. Um, it was a collaboration between Boston Public Works, Boston Transportation, Boston Parks, and Boston Water and Sewer. Uh, so this project, what you're seeing on the screen right now is the before image, um, aerial image. So the circle that you're seeing in the middle is the park that existed prior to uh, this project. Um, and what you're also probably seeing around this uh, circular park is a lot of asphalt, um, a very standard um, Boston traffic pattern, which means uh, it's a little confusing. Um, it's not uh, particularly clear uh, where the lanes are. Um, the crossings are quite long um, and not great for pedestrians. There's no bike infrastructure. Um, so it, all in all, this project or this location uh, had a lot of uh, uh, goals, a lot of things that needed to be uh, addressed. And so those four departments that I mentioned got together and designed, next slide please, uh, this beautiful, uh, large green infrastructure feature um, that took the small kind of circular park space and it's expanded it. So you can see that there's quite a bit more park space that was created. Uh, it created defined traffic patterns, shortened our pedestrian crossings. You can see that there are bike lanes um, and defined parking areas. So the, the general kind of goal of the project was, or the general kind of 
I don't know, the goal, I guess is the right word, of the project was to create a, a an area that had a more logical transportation um, you know, pattern and a more logical use pattern. Um, but as a result of all of the physical changes that were made in this space, we were also able to make some pretty uh, amazing green infrastructure additions as well. So this project uh, includes, uh, next slide please, sorry, includes um, a variety of different types of green infrastructure features. There are several different porous paving solutions that were used here. So different types of porous paving materials. Um, there's porous asphalt, porous pavers, porous concrete. Um, there is also, uh, you can see on the center image here, there's these two green vertical lines. Um, those two lines represent a large uh, infiltration trench that has um, a, a ton of trees planted in it and has created this beautiful tree alley that runs down the center of the park. Um, so uh, pedestrians are able to walk in a beautiful shaded space as opposed to walking on a sidewalk, um, you know, that has no no shade and no trees um, and, and is maybe a little bit closer to traffic than people enjoy. And, um, you know, so this this addition of green infrastructure changed the feel of this project and it also allowed for, I believe the drainage area is over three acres. So it's currently capturing runoff for, from over three acres um, in and around Central Square and infiltrating it back into the ground. So um, next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry, I, I know that the next is uh, a little irritating, but um, the image that you're seeing on the screen is uh, was taken obviously during construction. So you're seeing these are the um, porous pavers that are being installed. And you can see on the side, those are the uh, trees when they were first planted in that tree alley that I mentioned. Next slide. This is the growth after five years. So this is what the same space that you were just seeing looks like after only five years. So the trees that were planted in these stormwater features are growing and thriving. This image was actually taken this year or this summer um, during the drought. So these trees were healthy and happy even during the drought that we were experiencing in Boston. I realized the picture was taken on a rainy day. That was intentional. Um, I went out to check on some of our features during a rain event, um, but just wanted to kind of point out that even during um, times of climate related stress um, and, and dry periods that the green infrastructure features are still thriving um, and the plants planted in them are still thriving. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, second project is one of the Boston Public Schools project. Uh, this uh, project was a collaboration between BPS and the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. Um, the image that you're seeing on the screen, this is the Washington, well, formerly the Washington Irving Middle School, now the Sumner Upper School. Um, and as you can see from this aerial, this is the before image, um, lots of pavement, uh, very much what Ken had described, um, a, a lot of our schools are very heavily paved, their schoolyards are very heavily paved. Um, you know, large parking lot, well, not in Boston, maybe not large parking lots, but parking lots that are essentially large asphalt areas. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So we uh, picked five schools in the city of Boston. This is one of the five and uh, did some green infrastructure designs and pilot well, piloted kind of green infrastructure schoolyards. Um, and so as you can see in the after image, um, we removed uh, a good amount of asphalt um, and added a, a suite of green infrastructure features. Um, next slide, please. The uh, renderings that you're seeing on the screen show you a little bit of what you're um, what you'll see on site. So this is the parking lot area. You can see that there's a um, a bioswale uh, that was added, but also more importantly, it's a side by side comparison of green infrastructure next to gray infrastructure. The parking lot is a rectangle. We divided it in half. Half of the drainage goes into the bioswale. Half of it goes into a concrete swale, so that students and teachers can have conversations about the difference between green and gray infrastructure structure and see how it functions side by side. Um, we uh, uh, There are some pictures coming so you can see kind of the difference in, in the trees that were planted. Um, the trees that are planted in the bioswale, spoiler alert, are um, like two times the size of the ones that are planted in uh, next to the gray infrastructure as well. So it's really, um, it's really compelling to see the difference in, in tree growth and, and size uh, when you use green infrastructure compared to gray infrastructure. Next slide. Uh, this image, you can see the large um, field that we put in the, the backyard of the school, as well as this large uh, bioretention area. It's currently the largest public bioretention area in the city of Boston, um, but we hope to uh, install others uh, in the near future. Next slide. 
So these are some before images of what the schoolyard looked like before we did the project. As you can see, lots of hardscape, um, lots of pavement, uh, lots of sediment and other things uh, collecting on surfaces. And then next slide. This is what it looks like now. So greener, uh, more plants, more vegetation. Uh, it's generally just a more comfortable space to be in. Um, and if you've ever been out or if you ever have the opportunity to walk by here, um, you'll see the students playing in um, all of these spaces and, and playing in the bioretention area and really just enjoying the space. It's a really lovely project. Uh, next slide. So just a couple of quick examples of private green infrastructure. The city of Boston is fortunate to have a really wonderful private property ownership community that um, has started to take the existing stormwater requirements to another level. Next slide, please. So these are some examples. Oh, okay, so the one on the left is the Prudential Center. This is the Prudential Center's green roof. It has been there as long as I've lived in Boston, so almost 20 years. Um, and that's a really impressive length of time because at the time, green roofs were not as common. Um, the image on the right is, uh, it's actually in Milan. Um, so these apartment buildings in Milan are becoming more and more common, but this is a vision that I have for city of Boston, that we will have these beautiful um, integrated green infrastructure buildings that have, um, you know, trees growing on terraces and uh, beautiful outdoor space for individuals who live in high rise buildings. Um, next slide. Uh, these are just an, a couple of additional examples of privately owned green infrastructure um, in the city of Boston, and then one example from Cambridge. Um, so uh, the middle top image, that's uh, 10 uh, World, Cent uh, World Trade Center, and that uh, project is, is under construction now. Uh, it's a large elevated park uh, that manages all the stormwater, and it's actually, um, it's the elevated part of it is that there's a seawall that has been built in, so the project will also help to protect the neighborhood behind this development, um, which is a really wonderful climate resilience benefit in addition to the green infrastructure that they designed. Um, and then the you know, living walls that you're seeing here, this is um, 100 Federal Street. Uh, and then the bottom left image is uh, Liberty Mutual's building. Um, it's um, living walls and green roof area. Uh, and then the Alewife Brook Wetland is the bottom right corner. Um, and the city of Boston is working on creating one of our own uh, large wetland areas. Um, more on that to come uh, as the project progresses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we also have some really wonderful examples of um, our hospitals. Uh, we have a lot of uh, green roofs and uh, urban farms and other things on the roofs of our hospitals. So this is the Boston Children's Hospital. Um, they have this really lovely healing garden uh, that's available to the public, but it also manages stormwater and improves water quality. Uh, next slide. We have the Stone Living Lab. Uh, the Stone Living Lab is a really wonderful group of individuals who are studying uh, living shorelines and trying to figure out how to increase the city's resilience to climate change. Um, this is uh, a picture that's taken from their UMass uh, area, their section, but they also have locations out on the Harbor Islands. Uh, next slide. And uh, Northeastern University and, and many of our universities are doing really wonderful work in the city, uh, you know, piloting innovative, interesting green infrastructure. So this is an image of one of the floating wetlands uh, that a Northeastern uh, PhD candidate is working on, um, has a lot of really wonderful data about the phosphorus removal and the efficacy of this feature. Um, and I would be happy to connect people if you're interested uh, in, in seeing that data, um, but really enjoying seeing the work that's coming out of our our universities and our students, um, because there's just some really wonderful ideas that, you know, you look at and you realize this is going to be part of the future and this is going to be part of what we start to see more commonly in the city of Boston. Um, next slide, please. So just uh, speaking of the future in the city of Boston, just want to go through a couple of really quick things that the city is working on and is doing right now. Um, uh, next slide, please. The uh, you know, really quick overview, we have some existing stormwater requirements in the city of Boston. Many of you on this call are probably familiar with them. Um, you know, we have Boston Water and Sewer Commission site plan review requirements, which requires uh, properties who come in for permits to infiltrate one inch um, of runoff over the total impervious area on your parcel or 1.25 inches over the total impervious if you're in the GCOD or your project is over a certain size. Um, we have our Article 80 smart utilities requirements, um, and those requirements uh, are specifically infiltrating 1.25 inches of runoff over the total square foot of impervious area uh, if your project meets a certain size threshold. Um, 
we have the Wetlands Protection Act requirements, and that requires uh, properties who come to the Conservation Commission to manage stormwater using the Mass Stormwater Handbook. Um, and then we also have the NIPTES permits that Ken spent some time talking about, which are now going to be applied to commercial, uh, industrial, and institutional properties that have over an acre of impervious cover. Um, next slide, please. So all of those requirements have resulted in this wonderful scatter map of um, green infrastructure features in the city of Boston. Um, so we already have quite a bit of green infrastructure in the city. Um, but if you look at the legend on the side, most of these green infrastructure features are subsurface. Um, they're dry wells, they're infiltration areas, injection wells. Um, they don't have those surface co-benefits that we are looking for. Um, you know, as part of the future of green infrastructure and stormwater management in the city of Boston. Uh, so next slide, please. One of the things that we are currently working on uh, is how do we capture more parcels, more properties than just development or redevelopment projects? There are examples of cities and towns across the country that have regulations that capture properties that are not just applying for permits, but just properties existing that have large amounts of impervious area. And the new uh, EPA uh, permits that, or excuse me, NIPTES permits that um, individual properties will have to apply for will help us in that area. Um, so we are excited that there will be, um, you know, some additional green infrastructure that will likely come out of, of that new um, regulatory requirement. Um, but we also kind of recognize that a lot of the requirements that exist call for stormwater management or infiltration. They don't specifically call out green vegetated infrastructure with co-benefits. And so one of the things that the city is working on right now is updating our, our language in our requirements to include specific wording about green infrastructure. Um, you know, the types of features that we would like to see first. And if you can't make that work, you know, here's the second tier that we're, you know, looking for. And if you can't make that work, here's the next tier that we're looking for. So trying to help guide our uh, developers and our private property owners to the types of stormwater management features that we are more interested in so that we don't end up with thousands of dry wells, which again, don't really provide a lot of co-benefits to the city of Boston. Um, we're also, uh, sorry, next slide. We're also uh, currently enacting our first green infrastructure policy. So uh, back in October, end of October, the city implemented its first green infrastructure policy, which requires um, green infrastructure, one of these five design alternatives that you're seeing on the screen to be implemented whenever the city, specifically city projects, um, whenever the city is changing curb geometry, building curb extensions. So the image on the right uh, is exactly what we are trying to avoid in the future. So you can see in the image on the right, an intersection was, it's called teeing it off. Um, so essentially this used to be this kind of Y-shaped large intersection. Um, and so the intersection was teed off because they're safer um, and they shorten pedestrian crossings and a variety of other transportation reasons. Um, but what resulted was this kind of negative space, a curb extension that was entirely paved. Uh, and so we are trying to avoid that condition in the future. And so this policy says that rather than just paving, like you see on the screen, you are required to put in either, a, you know, some kind of bioretention, so a rain garden or a bioswale, or an infiltrating tree pit um, of some kind, uh, or you can do uh, porous paving. So for example, if you need to maintain a hard surface for some reason, um, you know, you can use a porous paving solution or you can do a subsurface um, infiltrating solution. Um, and then last but not least, you can also just seed it instead of, um, you know, paving it. So making it very clear that, um, you know, we do not want just large areas of asphalt because we are not sure what to do with it. Now you have guidance. Here's what you're supposed to do with it. Um, the policy also has two maintenance contracts uh, involved in it as well. And um, one of them is regenerative air sweeping. I actually just saw a question pop up. Um, that is, it's a fancy machine that vacuum sweeps, um, you know, pulls uh, particles, sediment, and other things out of the void space between porous paving material. So porous asphalts, porous pavers have gaps and pores in them. And so sand and sediment and, and nutrients and other things end up in those voids and regenerative air sweepers um, brush and suck them up um, so that your features continue to function um, and continue to be porous. 
Um, and then the second contract is a landscape maintenance contract, which we're actually awarding um, this week. So uh, the landscape maintenance contract will allow a contractor to go out and perform maintenance on the plants uh, and, and prune our trees and a variety of other things um, for our, our vegetated green infrastructure. We're also doing a volunteer program, which is pretty excited or pretty exciting. Um, and there'll be more information on that as well, but it will allow volunteer or residents in the city of Boston to adopt a green infrastructure feature um, and you know be part of caring for these features uh, in moving forward. Next slide. I think this is all right. So last couple of additional efforts. Um, I, I now have the joy of uh, reviewing PIC projects. And so you can assume that there will be comments requesting green infrastructure in projects that come through PIC. Um, the city is also considering some policies uh, that uh, are similar to the green infrastructure policy that affects our right of ways and curb extensions, but it will be applied to other departments. Um, and we're also looking at programmatic changes and events and other things that will help to expand uh, green infrastructure implementation. So for example, uh, rain barrel events where we'll be giving out rain barrels and things like that. So uh, next slide. Uh, contact information uh, is on the screen. I know it'll be sent out to everyone. Apologies um, for rushing a bit at the end there. Um, I appreciate everybody being here um, and I will turn it back to Adam. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Kate. That was a real great presentation. I really love the visuals of what's possible with green infrastructure in and of itself, as well as the co-benefits that it can provide. So next, let's turn to Patrick Heron from the Mystic River Watershed Association, who's gonna provide a more uh, broad look at what's happening in the Mystic River watershed and some of the measures that Boston and other communities have taken to reduce issues regarding stormwater runoff. Uh, but before Patrick starts, I do wanna highlight that Patrick allowed me one of the most interesting and exciting experiences of my professional life. And that was counting herring and eels as they crossed the Mystic River dams or climbed up the ladder at the Mystic River dam. So. Patrick, uh, very, very interesting role Patrick serves in the Mystic River Watershed. He's not gonna talk about those, those countings today, but we are very interested in hearing what he has to share from his perspective at the Watershed Association. So Patrick, to you. Uh, well, to Adam and the Green Ribbon Commission, thank you for hosting uh, this wonderful discussion. And I'm glad that was an impactful uh, experience for you, Adam. And I think this type of conversation is really a wonderful opportunity. There actually is a great community of folks who are very interested in green infrastructure who have been investing thought and energies for a number of years. And I'd include folks like the Charles River Watershed Association and BWSC, among other parties who I think are listening in today who have been um, moving the dial as well. So next slide, please. Just briefly, our organization is an environmental advocacy organization. We are located in Arlington, but serve uh, 21 communities, and we're working in areas of water quality and greenways, climate resilience, education, restoration, and stewardship with 15 staff. Next slide, please. And um, more broadly than a city, we're a watershed. So uh, we're working across a geographic area that's connected uh, by how water flows, as it turns out. And it flows across municipal boundaries, across these 76 square miles and 21 communities and 600,000 people. Next slide, please. And the communities that are in our watershed are at times among the most diverse and lowest income, and at other times uh, are well off and less, uh, less diverse. But um, among our challenges is uh, thinking about how do we affect change across um, so many municipal boundaries and so much municipal government. Um, this is basically one and a half times the land area of Boston, <clears throat> and yet we're divided into 21 different um, decision-making bodies, if you will. Next slide. Um, and I'll say what I think many of you know is that the last few years, um, as a result of this pandemic, have actually shown a light on these natural resources in a way um, that was really helpful. Folks are out there using the parks and the rivers for recreation and shining a light on that habitat and the values that we uh, place in them. Next slide, please. And as much as we uh, talk about these natural resources, and I was grateful to um, hear this description of, of treating stormwater like an asset, cities do change rivers. And whether you have a dam turning a river into a long pond, as uh, is the case here in the Mystic and in the Charles, 
or you have the significant built infrastructure that um, determines the economy of the region, um, the impervious cover that uh, contributes to the significant condition of the river. And finally, you see the symptoms of that. And this is similar to the slide that uh, Ken shown earlier in the um, presentation. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to just speak uh, briefly about three areas of this work and um, how it intersects a bit with the city of Boston. I want to talk a little bit about how important this regulatory environment, uh, uh, how it's set by the EPA and the DEP, among other parties, the, the regional collaboration that we have ongoing, and share a little bit about infiltration uh, trenches, this experiment that we have ongoing um, in our watershed. Next slide, please. So uh, the first thing I just want to comment on um, is uh, that there are no voluntary actors in this uh, work um, and how important that regulatory framework is. Um, permits and enforcement have driven municipal funding in these issues for a long time. And the reason for that is that municipal scales and others who are on this call can probably chime in with even more anecdotes about this, but you have uh, a lot of competing uh, priorities and built-in constituencies in these communities who are ensuring that property taxes stay low, the schools are outstanding, the police and fire are properly valued and social services are pro provided. And so by the time that you get to taking care of the river and taking care of your stormwater, um, there's, there's little, little, little room in that conversation or there has been little room. And so the regulatory framework has developed in, in that environment. And perhaps one of the outcomes of these conversations like um, that we're having today and the focus that folks like Kate are providing in the city of Boston is to shift away from just the actions of DPWs as public safety institutions, as ones that are protecting our environment and make that a part of the spirit of that agency uh, or that division. And I'll note that the, the example that Ken gave of uh, Portland is a, a really great case of how regulation and enforcement has driven significant investment and changed the character of Portland in a really significant way. And that they do have um, watershed protection as a part of the city services that they are providing now. So the points of leverage, uh, um, I'll say one more thing about this, is that one more piece of evidence that regulation and permits are driving this is that in our watershed, um, despite the fact that we are struggling with water quality issues, there is only one community to date that's actually uh, invested in a stormwater utility for consistent funding. And there's only one community in the last few years that has accessed uh, state revolving fund uh, funds in a meaningful way in the last few years. And that is a municipality that is under a consent decree in a really meaningful way. And so we really need this regulation um, and this work to, to move this forward. So, you know, I, I'm referencing the, some of the same regulatory documents that Ken and Kate uh, did as well around the alternative total maximum daily load, which we're pleased to hear is going to be incorporated into the next MS4 permit. That MS4 permit that each of our individual smaller municipalities will be under. Um, I'll note that uh, combined sewer overflows still remain a really important um, infrastructure challenge in the Boston metro area. And we are coming to the close of the first Boston Harbor cleanup case. And we're beginning the discussions of what do the next 20 years uh, mean for investment in correcting these issues? And that most assuredly will include green infrastructure in parts of that system. And then finally, how important this uh, last section is around the residual designated authority. And I'll just briefly note that if you look on that image on my upper right here, and you look at all that impervious cover, so much of that impervious cover is, is built uh, already and would not be required to do anything to address their pollutants unless they are issued a permit in this residual designated authority. The current permitting authorities that 
the um, municipalities are operating under really are about new development. And the residual designated authority is really asking everybody to pitch in, including folks that developed their property 20 years ago and addressing the externalities of their development. Next slide. Um, so I want to chat a, a, a little bit about regional collaboration. And as a start, I want to get a little bit into the co-benefits conversation that um, um, both of my prior speakers referenced. And that is that, um, you know, the flooding that we see happening. First of all, this would be a 100-year storm event in the Mystic River watershed in 2070, and it shows overbank flooding. It's not a perfect image because it, co it colors both the river and the overbank flooding, but, you know, that's what you see. There's overbank flooding um, according to the river, but little to the rest of the watershed, modest in terms of the acreage compared to the rest of the watershed. Next slide. But if you look at the scale of the flooding that happens in other parts of the system, this is really where the flooding uh, is really significant. And that's in the urban infrastructure in areas that are low-lying areas, areas that have been developed piecemeal over time. And this is where people are being impacted, their routes to schools, their personal property, and in some cases, exposure to pollutants. And so as we talk about the co-benefits of this work, um, one of them, uh, as noted by my peers on the call and the panel, is that we can target the green infrastructure in areas where we have another problem that we need to solve. And that perhaps instead of building the next larger pipe to get the water to the river, we can incorporate these elements of green infrastructure that provide the co-benefits of both storage of water, but also treating that water and creating the amenities that make these great places to live. Next slide. So somewhat out of, uh, next slide, please. Um, somewhat out of those observations, we uh, formed a collaborative in our uh, watershed. This is the Resilient Mystic Collaborative. It's facilitated by my colleague, Julie Wormser, and really benefits from active participation out of 19 out of our 21 communities. And the real benefit is uh, sharing of ideas and learnings across these uh, municipalities, but also the opportunity to develop regional projects that um, yield more efficient outcomes. And um, I'll note that this is work that has been uh, funded uh, to a large degree by the Barr Foundation, who saw value of uh, this climate work in the Mystic. Next slide. Um, uh, you know, the first thing that this group did was uh, develop a shared um, uh, model of the Mystic River watershed for hydrology. So instead of each of our municipalities hiring the same contractors to develop the model again and again and again, we uh, benefited from extending a model that was developed in Cambridge first and to other parts of the watershed and uh, started a dialogue about uh, these shared solutions. And through that work, we were able to begin thinking about how do we store so much water um, and began looking at properties throughout the watershed that were greater than three acres and went through and filtered those properties for the characteristics that would allow us to achieve uh, water storage and provide benefit and have some ease of implementation. Next slide. <clears throat> and it, we've gotten to the place that we have started to get into the municipal systems. Next slide. And understand the opportunities and develop both conceptual designs as well as 75% designs. And now we're uh, getting close to the construction phase on a couple of these stormwater wetlands up in Woburn, a couple, uh, one in uh, Redding, another in uh, Stoneham, and another in uh, Everett, a wetland. Next slide. And of course, the Holy Grail is the type of structure that was referenced uh, earlier in the panel, which is the Cambridge Alewife Stormwater Wetland, which is a three and a half acre property that basically polishes the water quality uh, of a separated part of the city of Cambridge and uh, provides uh, a lot of passive recreation opportunities and habitat, among other things. And while at the time this um, was litigated because it um, was placed on public land and people were concerned about the takeaway from other um, elements and habitat, 
I think all parties agree that this has tend, ended up being uh, an amazing attribute. So this is what we're looking for. And of course, one of our challenges is that in the urban um, landscape, it's really hard to find big properties where you can do this type of thing. So that's one challenge is um, how do you find spots for, for this type of thing? I'll just say one more thing is that there are a really limited number of um, private foundations that will catalyze work on stormwater, but there are quite a few private foundations who would be excited about helping you develop park space and public amenities for people. And so coupling these attributes together, you can really achieve something wonderful. And the city of Cambridge and MWRA uh, and the ratepayers um, really did something pretty wonderful here. Next slide. I want to share a little bit about this uh, recent experimentation that we've been doing um, and uh, sort of the lessons learned. Um, on the left is uh, not an infiltration trench. Uh, it's a bio basin. And on the right is the infiltration trench I'll talk about in a moment. But um, as we as an organization began partnering with our municipalities on green infrastructure, among the first types of structures we were building were these types of rain gardens and bio basins as we did in Arlington. And to all the points raised from the city of Boston, these of course are providing a lot of co-benefits for the city or the town around um, beautifying a neighborhood, cooling the space, um, reducing the crossing distance at this particular one-way street, um, and raising awareness of stormwater, um, which is really important in the long term for, for creating that constituency that I referenced. It also challenges us a little bit in these smaller municipalities to build the framework for maintaining these structures. It's one thing to build them, but to take care of them um, is another thing. So these play a really important role in the um, long-term strategy of these communities to incorporate this type of structure. We also, one of the challenges we realized in building these is that it actually costs quite a bit to design these structures and implement. So, you know, in some of these cases, 40 to 50% of our costs were around design. And we really wanted to find something that um, we could implement at scale. Um, stormwater pollutants don't come from one site. Um, it's not like uh, the discharge of one factory is impacting our area. These pollutants are distributed pretty evenly throughout the landscape, actually. So we need a lot of distributed structures. Um, so on the right-hand side was an experiment we developed in collaboration with the town engineer of Arlington, Wayne Chenard, who I give a lot of credit to. And this is not a structure that gives co-benefits but it is an attempt to see if we could really find a way to efficiently um, implement some of these solutions. So that is um, a stormwater trench. Next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna ask you to put on your three-dimensional hat for a moment and see that this image on the top part here is looking down on the edge of the street. That hash mark area is a catch basin that um, perforated um, sort of rectangle going off to the left is a perforated pipe underground nestled in stone. And where it says number three, that's where it goes off to the river. So if you go down to the bottom part of this image, that shows you how water goes into the catch basin at number two. It lands in the sump and begins to fill up that catch basin. You probably never knew how a catch basin worked, but this is how it works. And that sump catches your material like sediment off of the street. And then we have a pipe that goes off to this trench that we built filled with stone. And the first uh, thing it does is as it fills up the sump, it goes off and starts to go into that stone. And um, after it fills up that section, we will then um, go off uh, to the river. We have a clean out port. Next slide, please. These are really simple structures. And, you know, our challenge is how do we... Um, uh, focus and find opportunities throughout the watershed. And so these are urban landscapes. And this is one of the other challenges is that not all sites really give you a great opportunity to infiltrate water. And if you look at the green in these uh, images, that's type A soils. Those are kind of your dream areas where the water actually gets into the soil 
And on the right, those are just sort of the, the distribution of catch basins as we're trying to align these and thinking about how many of them are in A or B type soils. Next slide. Um, and this is what it looks like as we start to uh, implement these at scale in different neighborhoods. This is in Arlington overlooking Hellwife Brook. And so it's allowed us to very efficiently cover a larger area. As I mentioned, these pollutants come from big areas. And so there's a place for larger structures like you're seeing at Central Square in East Boston. And then in some neighborhoods, we have to distribute these structures. Next slide. And um, you know, here's the virtue, is that we can actually achieve pretty significant uh, pollution reductions on a really modest cost, $144,000 for 24 sites. That turns out to be about $20,000 per pound of phosphorus removed. Um, and where if you looked at our rain garden, it's probably closer to 50 or $75,000 a pound. So as we're investing, it's that combination of looking for these co-benefits and creating the towns and cities we want to live in, while also efficiently working throughout the town to try to capture as many of these nutrients as possible. Next slide. Um, next slide. So across these three scales, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. And um, this, this is what we can get from a panel like today. You know, on the left, we have our trench that gives you almost no co-benefit, and we're learning how most efficiently to tackle pollutants at scale, but we're also learning how long will the structure um, survive and still function capturing that phosphorus. It will get clogged up eventually. And for these sites like this rain garden in the middle, how are we going to sustainably fund this program in these communities, have the maintenance capacity to take care of them, and how can they catalyze greater knowledge and interest in these stormwater issues? And then finally, third, this is where that magic that everybody's describing is, we've got other problems in these communities like flooding, which actually get a lot of people and a big constituency showing up and supporting. And we can really change the, uh, the tenor of a community and the quality of a park space by integrating these wonderful attributes. Next slide. And I just wanna say thank you and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was really a great presentation with a lot of on the ground implementation and sort of the cost benefit analysis that you've outlined, I think is an important part of this work as cities, towns, private entities think about making these investments in a strategic fashion. So we have about 17 minutes uh, until 10 to go through some Q and A. We probably got about 20 questions that have come in. So we likely won't get to all of them, but I'll set that as sort of a a mindset for maybe a lightning round type fashion. So let, let me start with what may be the easiest one that came in, which um, is just an acronym question. Ken, what is a BMP? Sorry, best management practice. And so that just defines what, you know, what, what the industry is saying is the best thing that we can be doing to deal with any particular situation. Yeah. Great, great, thank you for that. So another question that came in early while you were talking, Ken, but I think all, Three of you could certainly speak to this is how, do, how does the issue of combined storm and sewage discharge play into what you've all spoken about today? I'll, I'll start. So as, as Patrick said, we are now looking at now that the MWA has completed its or almost completed its 20 year CSO plan. The next phase of that is to look at, well, given the results of that plan, what else should be done with CSOs? So looking at the whole range of options for additional CSO controls and certainly green infrastructure can be an effective way to deal with CSO controls. When I mentioned Portland, they are using green infrastructure to great, with great success to address combined sewer overflows. So that's definitely one of the co-benefits we wanna look at. That's great to hear. Yeah, Kate? I have some, yeah, I have, I have an additional kind of I don't know, thing that people don't often think about, but now that we've done a fair amount of sewer separation in Boston and, um, you know, kind of across the country, we have a fair amount of storm water that during small storm events used to go to treatment plants. It used to go to our wastewater treatment plants. And now a hundred percent of our storms, that storm water is now going to our water bodies without any treatment before it gets there. And so 
green infrastructure is a great way for us to provide that pre-treatment. So even if your feature doesn't capture all of your runoff, maybe it's sized to capture just the first inch, which is typically the dirtiest um, you know, water that we see coming off of our hard surfaces. Um, but it can also be used to completely remove water from the system, which is, to Ken's point, a very valuable tool in reducing future CSOs um, in areas that are not separated. So I think that there's a there's a piece of this here that now that we have separated a lot of our areas, we m almost more so need to be installing green infrastructure in the separated areas to treat that stormwater that used to go to treatment plants. I'll just I'll just add that's a great point, and um, you know I think as we're um, figuring out the next investment in um, addressing CSOs, we'll be asking these parties to model the benefits of incorporating green infrastructure into these projects. And I just want to just talk about the trade-off a little bit is some of our most efficient green infrastructure are actually small distributed systems that get the first 0.1 inches of the storm, your first flush of pollutants, which have the biggest bang for your buck. And often these storms are the, the the flooding that we have are actually big rainfall events and need big storage. And so there's actually a contradiction in terms about distributed small and more uh, size needed for handling all of this water, especially in CSO areas. So that's one of our challenges a little bit, optimizing that. Sounds like we just need it everywhere, like big, small, all over the place. <laughs> that sound like that. So thank you for that. I'm gonna shift to another theme of questions we've received about maintenance of these various investments. And you've all spoken to it to some degree, but I'd love to hear a, a deeper dive from any or all of you about, you know, how, how do we figure out ways to sort of economically invest in this ongoing maintenance? How do we convince departments that have been doing something one way for a very long time to start doing things in a different way? Um, Maybe Kate can talk about Boston's resident adoption program. I'd, I'd love to hear more about how we maintain this infrastructure. And I'll, and I'll say from my perspective, having worked in Arlington uh, before serving in this role, you know, the idea of vacuuming porous sidewalks was crazy to DPW at first, right? It's, those are real management issues that you have to try to figure out. So I'd, lo I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on that. Uh, Ken, do you want to start? Go ahead, you want to go first? Yeah, okay, I'll go first. Um, so one of the things that I found uh, when I first started uh, back in July was, uh, you know, maintenance was the kind of primary barrier, if you will, to installing green infrastructure for most departments. The concern of we don't know how to maintain it, we don't have the equipment, we don't have the expertise, um, you know, that was the that was the main thing that I was hearing. And, and that was largely true, you know, when I was working for Boston Water and Sewer years ago, and it, it's still true today. And one of the things that we did for the you know, as part of the policy is we included some maintenance contracts so that at least in the short term, we had, you know, an outside contractor who was going to come in and provide a lot of this maintenance while we put in the work to train up and staff up our maintenance departments and not just in public works, but throughout the city departments. So one of the things that I'm working on is the city is going to be um, bringing in full-time employees, operations staff, training them up um, under my new office, and then essentially helping to source them into jobs in other departments throughout the city, other operations jobs. So that's one thing. And then the volunteer program was just kind of like another idea that we had that lots of cities around the country, Portland, Seattle, and others, they all have like adopt a rain garden programs that allow the public to get involved. Um, and so as a result of the public being involved in, um, you know, in doing kind of beautification, superficial maintenance, um, you know, we also were creating a new job pool of, or a new candidate pool of people who were interested in getting into this field and wanted to be part of this work. So you get the, the volunteer component of getting people invested in their neighborhoods, but then you also get individuals who are interested in taking trainings, getting certifications, and then applying for these jobs. So we've got a couple of ongoing things that should hopefully result in, um, in better maintenance over Overall, but in the short term, we're looking at contracts and volunteers. Um, and then in the long term, we're looking at beefing up our operations. Thank you, Kate. Patrick, Ken? Uh, yeah, I'll just say it's a great chance to um, catalyze an economy of, of jobs and green jobs in our community. And I'll, I'll note there's, uh, I think there's a great program at Codman Square Neighborhood Development that's working on um, training for green jobs like this. And it'll be really exciting to see how it fits into uh, Kate's plans in Boston. Um, 
we're still trying to crack this nut around me. So I'm still listening here. We're yeah. quite interested. Dave, uh, Cody and I actually are, he's going to come do training with me at City of Boston. He and I helped, we put this, the Codman Square training together years ago, and I'm really glad that that was, it was successful. And so now we're going to expand it and offer the trainings more often. So it's coming. <laughs> it's clearly a culture change, but it's the kind of culture change that people like as they start to see it. And, you know, we saw it in Portland, we saw it in Seattle. And, you know, people, I, I remember the DPW people out in Portland saying they had created a maintenance budget and program, but when they started to go out to the sites, they found that the neighbors were really maintaining it. People really liked the stuff and you can't count on that. Can't be your program is to hope the neighbors will do it. But if you have a more deliberate program, like the adoption program with training and things, then the culture change really will build on itself because this is something people like when they see it. Agreed, agreed. So another question that came in, which is sort of a practical question like maintenance is, how are we thinking about making sure that when we're implementing bioswales or retention basins or whatever the implementation might be, that we're doing so in a way that matches up with mobility and accessibility goals in our municipalities, making sure we're not placing it too close to a bus stop and creating a tripping hazard or being in the way of those who may be in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller. Is there a systematic way that we have seen departments looking at this or just any, any thoughts on how we're making sure that varied goals that we have are being met while we're looking at green infrastructure implementation? I'll, I'll, I'll start and just say, um, I, I think um, Ken said it correctly, we're in this sh moment of shifting uh, the paradigm of how we do this work. And I think the um, first phase of this green infrastructure work is squeezing in pieces of green infrastructure where we can and retrofitting a few sites. And I think this next phase we're coming into is incorporating these structures into the long-term planning and master planning and major road retrofits um, as a road gets um, rehabilitated in some way or lanes get changed. And I think that is where a lot of the um, opportunities come from to, to meet the goals of the transit community, the disabled community, safety, uh, the aesthetics of these communities over time. Absolutely, yeah. And the, the two examples that I gave during my presentation were projects that were not initially kind of green infrastructure projects. They were, um, you know, the Central Square project was identified as a transportation and accessibility improvement project at first. And then, you know, the schools projects, the schools that we chose, many of them were on the list for site improvements from BPS already. Um, and so, you know, I think that, very, you know, eloquently put that we're transitioning into this new stage where we're essentially planning all of our projects. Green infrastructure is one of the elements that is just part of these, you know, initial kind of scoping conversations, um, you know, the same way that accessibility is part of the conversation, the same way that, um, you know, reducing the, you know, or shortening the distance of crossings and things was a part of the conversation. So it's, it's now they're just kind of becoming more integrated into our, our general project scopes. And because we're we're into that, um, you know, part of of project planning now, we're also working on uh, standards and other things that are very clear about, you know, here are your here are your setback distances, here are your you know here's your minimum distance from crosswalks, here's you know, so putting together design guidelines that are are clear about, you know where we have found um, these features are most effective, how to install them safely, um, you know, how they can be, uh, you know, mass installed or mass designed and installed at scale, um, you know, while still accomplishing all of the other goals that, um, you know, that we have to be aware of at City. So um, working on that now, and that will obviously be more um, publicized as we get closer to completing them. Right. So we have about five minutes left, not, not to exclude you from that round, Ken, but I think the big the, the big question that we could probably do another GRCX all by itself on that has come through in these questions is how are we going to pay for all of this? And I think you probably all mentioned in some form or another the potential for a storm or a utility uh, or or regulations that mandate the expenditure of funds for green infrastructure. But I'd be curious in hearing any of your takes on what's the three, five, ten year outlook on how we should be thinking about paying 
for these investments? Again, we, we know about stormwater utilities, federal infrastructure money. H how are you looking at? How are you looking at the funding picture? Well, well I'll start. Um, we now have fifty billion dollars in federal infrastructure money in the water program. Um, there's money in other environmental areas as well, but water got most of the money in the infrastructure law that was passed. And so that is just a huge flood of resources. And stormwater is specifically singled out in the statute as one of the priority areas that funding should be directed to. So this is the perfect time for a municipality to say, we're gonna fix our stormwater system. We need to make all these investments to address water quality as well as other municipal goals. And there's a big pot of money available there is a lot of it is available in, in low interest loans, but also a lot is available in forgivable loans. So this is just the ideal time to make these investments. Ken, are all those dollars dedicated to public institutions or do you envision there being opportunities for private entities to either directly or indirectly access those funds? The municipalities would be receiving the funds, um, but I think it's, uh, there's a lot to, to be thought about in terms of, as the municipalities deal with their permit obligations that also, as I said, involve managing stormwater flow from privately owned properties. Is there a way to use those funds in some way to help make all that happen? Great. And Patrick or Kate, could, could one of you talk a little bit more about a stormwater, a stormwater utility and how that functions and how that could generate revenues to be able to implement projects like this? Yeah, I'm Go happy ahead. to. Yeah. Oh, do you want me to? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, all of the funding that Ken just talked about is is valuable and important, and and I really do believe that cities and towns need to take advantage of this. But obviously, we can't depend on federal funding because it's not consistent and it doesn't provide revenue for you know stable, predictable revenue every year. Um, so stormwater fees are largely used to provide that stable, predictable revenue that you know that you're going to get every year, and so you can form your program around this funding source. So there are stormwater fees across the country, and there are even some outside of our country, but typically they are a fee that is assessed to a, a, an individual property. And it's usually based on the amount of impervious cover or hard surface on your property. So your, your roof area, your driveways, your parking lots, tennis courts, you know, whatever hard surface you have on your property, that square footage determines how large or small your fee would be. So all property owners in the city pay into this stormwater fee. And the revenue that's generated from that is used specifically and only for work on stormwater um, infrastructure. And that includes green infrastructure, but um, you know, regular updates and other things that have to happen for your stormwater system, but also implementing like larger infrastructure projects. Um, credit, usually these fees have credit programs or grant programs. Um, and credit programs are used to help incentivize uh, property owners to, um, you know, build green infrastructure on their sites or provide education about stormwater, um, you know, and a variety of other services. And then grant programs are often used so that private property owners can apply for a grant to install green infrastructure on their site, and then they can apply for a credit because now they have green infrastructure on their site. So it's a really interesting funding mechanism that is used to just kind of provide stable funding for cities and towns. Um, they're pretty common. We have several in Massachusetts, um, and I think you know they're they're a really great solution to um, to our financing issue, which I see there are a lot of questions in the chat about it. Um, Ken, other or um, Patrick, anything else that I, I might have. Uh, just to quickly add that, um, you know, a lot of uh, the opportunity here is for EPA and DEP to uh, actually help municipalities understand um, their obligations during the next 20 years. And then that makes the city councils and the town councils, town members rise up to uh, budget and achieve that vision. So I'll come back to my, there are no voluntary actors in this uh, system. So. Thank you all for that. So we are just about at time. I, I wanna thank all three of you for all the time that you gave us this morning and your expertise. I know you put a lot of time in before today preparing for this and I'm very appreciative of, appreciative of it. I certainly learned a lot. I, I hope all those that tuned in did. I wanna remind everybody that we are gonna send out a recording uh, of, this, uh, of this broadcast today as well as the slides. And I want to ask everybody to look um, look out for our future GRCXs, which will be coming very soon, uh, as well as innovation tours. 
Uh, we should have something scheduled in February on scope three emissions, and then we will be planning future GRCX webinars uh, throughout the course of the year. If you go to greenribboncommission.org to our calendar, you can see these as they're being scheduled, and hopefully you'll be able to sign in in the future and benefit from uh, future expert panelists that we'll have. So thank you again to the three of you for being here today. Thank you to all of those who logged in, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you.